Everyone, I need your help for this segment. We're going to be looking at rogue decks out of these events. I'll give my opinions on these. I need you guys to comment and like down below. Tell me which rogue decks you want me to cover for part two of this. I'm not going to make this series in advance each day. It'll be you guys tell me what you want me to talk about. I'll pick five of them. We'll roll it out to the next one. And the next one, there's like 30 rogue decks that you could be talking about right now. You're going to have success with. So if you guys can do that, well, stick on into part one. Sponsored by me. Just kidding. Yeah, they were picked by me. Hehe. <laughs> I guess. All right. So we're going to talk about probably the most competitive rogue decks. Stuff that has done something over the last couple weeks. Thanks, Asian Persuasion. You guys, you've really sponsored or uh, promoted this video, per se, with your wonderful tops. Like, <laughs> so, number one on this list is Noble Knights. Now, Johnny did wonders with this deck. And for those of you that don't really know what Noble Knights like to do, we like to make super big Artorgi S guy with Excalibur and attached to it and laugh at our opponent as well they can't really do anything. We also have control through Alpha Duder. Also, also, we like to just we're we're kind of protect the castle. We basically set up noble knights, actually play the game with our opponent, basically end their strategy. And did I mention that this deck has combo starters out the wazoo? Uh literally two monsters is a sold. Medrot literally starts your whole combo and you just you get places like it's kind of how the deck works and you just massively attempt to break your opponent's board also in other variants you can abuse mystic mine and i mean <laughs> you're, you're basically stop your opponent from playing the game dot deck in some variants other variants you're just a control deck like noble knight's last round of support was really good i mean asian persuasion saw that took advantage of that and piloted the deck to top 32 and his last regional. And I love hearing, like, I do these videos because I like seeing Rogue do well. Like, it's it's a good thing that Rogue exists for these things. So yes, congratulations, Johnny, for putting Noble Knight, not necessarily back on the map, but bringing them to people's attention. Like, the invite stories are what we like to hear. And, of course, that brings number two to our list here. He also played Spellbooks, yet again. Uh, in two weeks, back to back, with rogue decks, Johnny took the challenge, and it's like, yeah, I I don't have to be good at Yu-Gi-Oh. I can sit here and I can play rogue, and by playing rogue, I get the chance to enjoy and engage in the game on different things. Plus, like, I really wish Johnny made more videos in depth on how to be a better player. I was actually asked that question the other day. It was like, hey, who would you recommend to watch to get better Yu-Gi-Oh. And Sam and Johnny are both very good players. But Sam's content is for fun and Johnny just doesn't upload anything on how to be a better player. So if you want those two guys, I think in terms of cognitive skill and things, there are a lot of things that you can learn. Also Johnny was playing ye old emergency provisions with his spellcaster prophecy deck. And you know how much we love time Right, guys? Oh, man. Time rules are so fun. They make Yu-Gi-Oh! so enjoyable. I love it oh so much. And then you're literally just like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, offer the handshake, and then your opponent goes, nah, emergency provisions. Eat off everything, including a Raigeki, by the way. Like, if, if you haven't seen that Twitch clip from uh, Collector's Cash, go give it a, a look. Um, that was genuinely a hilarious thing to see and Johnny finishing ninth place with prophecy definitely it, it, it's a good thing like back to back it shows that a good player with a good strategy can actually do something in the format so ladies and plus I mean people not knowing how to play against certain matchups definitely will play to your advantage so that's that's it for prophecy there so kudos Johnny Two back-to-back -back talks here. Now, next up, we had a Rogue Time Lord deck, top eight, original, two weeks back. And I covered the Time Lord deck. Somebody actually messaged me on Facebook. They're like, oh, man, you're pathetic for being afraid of Time Lords. And you, 
He literally just like, okay, like, who does that? So like, when, when I talk about Time Lords and I don't want to deal with them, I don't like the fact that they're basically just walls that stall out the game. I understand that that's progressively literally what the deck does. Like, you set up Time Maidens and things like that, and you just, you set big guys on the field and you disrupt your opponent's field. Like, that's what Time Lords seek to do, right? They're all just huge bodies that burn through effect damage. Well, I don't like not having an interactive Yu-Gi-Oh! It's really funny. Like, I play Sky Striker, and I love Stun. Hmm. That's, uh, those are two big yikes for me, Chief. But progressively, yeah, that's kind of what I got out of this so far. So, what happened, really, with Time Lords? I don't know. I just... Seeing that the deck made top eight means that the deck beat enough people that I almost want to say that players didn't... They, did, did they not know how to play the Time Lord matchup? Because I'm going to be honest with you, if I'm going into a regional and I'm not too prepared, uh, I would definitely probably lose to Time Lords. Uh, uh, just, you just you see Time Lords or you just Widow Anchor them all. Like, that's pretty good. That was the biggest thing I heard about Time Lords is just like, Widow Anchor is really good against them. Uh, leaving one Time Lord on the field and just not allowing them to have other ones on the field and negating that effect, uh, it's pretty good from uh, what I saw. So, I don't know, it's, I guess, it's a little things to count. So, Time Lords actually progressively doing something out here. I didn't actually think I'd ever be talking about Time Lords as an actual deck, but <laughs> this regional season has been pretty whack. Now, next up on our list here is Stun. Coming out of the Rosemont, Illinois Regional, we saw one lucky duelist piloting a stun variant. And actually, this was relatively interesting because this was a combination of stun and Grand Manju. And it wasn't even like super Grand Manju based. It was, we have double Grand Manju in the deck with some evenly matched, some extravagance, and some Pot of Desires. Because uh, one thing that I've noticed that stun's always kind of had a problem missing is trying to close the game. And it's honestly having Grand Manju in a stun deck. Okay, so like you have to watch your normal summons. Uh, I'll, I'll be straight honest with you there. Like if you if you have too many normal summons in the deck, you'll bog yourself down. But if looking at his ratios, double fossil nine and double Inspector Border, I was I, I was okay with this. I, I think for the most part, uh, he made relatively good deck building choices. And that's not a bad thing at all. Like, the ratio-wise, it looked great. And seeing one Jaugen, uh, being able to triple Jaugen through a uh, Dingrisu turn, uh, as long as my opponent doesn't have a Crescendo, pretty good. Oh, by the way, Jaugen also says that your uh, opponent can't swash summon uh, until they normal summon the Harpoor and beat over your guy. But, I mean, that's what we play trap cards for. Am I right, guys? But... Uh, denying the opponent the essential ability to even play the game is what Stun seeks to do. And this is Duelist, he had the right idea at the end of the day. Like, he just straight denied everything to come out of that. And that was, that was really heartwarming to me. Seeing that Stun... <sighs> I love Stun so much. So you just, you have to let the big giant lug love his deck here. That's, that's all I'm saying. And the last rogue deck I'm going to toss in this video is good old Subterror. Subterror has continued to sit at this dinner table for the longest time, and it shouldn't be any real surprise that it's here. Now, the craziest thing that came out of Subterror was we had a list that was playing two dimensional shifter, or yeah, dimensional shifter, the discard, turn on Macrocosmo for the whole turn, um, the one that you can't have a graveyard for. He was also playing a zombie world. Now, he didn't top 8 his regional. He made top 32 with it. But it definitely proves that these tech choices that these decks are really making right now really are holding them together. Like, you gotta, you gotta admit, guys, that seeing cool, innovative strategies, I mean, the same thing over and over again, with some new spice, definitely, it warms up your little Yu-Gi-Oh heart. And that's a good thing, right guys? Like, you have to understand, innovation in this game is literally as easy as just one or two tech choices for a certain matchup. So, I mean, hey, it's it's the little things, right? Like, it could be as easy as main decking Zombie World, 
in a nine round tournament and winning because of it. That's Yu-Gi-Oh! in a nutshell. Don't you guys love it? That concludes part one of this. If you guys want me to talk about other decks and the format, please leave a list down below. I will groove my way on into that as we can, and we'll guys catch you on the flip side. Peace out.